guys, how's it going? Today we're gonna to talk about 15 different types of perennials that really love the heat. Kind of an appropriate time of year as it is supposed to reach 106 degrees Fahrenheit in our area today. Uh, we have talked about this subject before. Three or four years ago, I did a video where we talked about five perennials, which were Russian sage, lavender, echinacea, rudbeckia, and sedum, amazing plants. I will not be covering those today. So if you'd like to learn more about those, we will link that video down below. But today we are talking about 15 more perennials that really thrive in the heat. Also, all of these perennials are sun lovers. So number one on my list are Coreopsis, also called tick seed. And these are just a wonderful, tough perennial. They're beautiful, full of flowers for most of the season from late spring all the way through fall. And they come in a wide range of colors. So multiple different colors of yellow, white, orange, pink, lavender, um, and some of them are bicolored. Most Coreopsis varieties you'll find fall within zone four through nine that's where they thrive and they typically will get anywhere between 18 and 24 inches tall and wide there are some smaller varieties that kind of clock in in like the 6 to 12 inch size but they're just a really nice size to tuck into a sunny border somewhere and they attract bees and butterflies like crazy a variety that I really like is called moonbeam it's got soft kind of lemon yellow flowers grows about a foot foot and a half tall and wide and its foliage is very thin like needle-like so it's a really beautiful contrast and it's just a very um, delicate looking plant there's also the coreopsis rosea rosea which is a pink coreopsis now this is the only type that doesn't really like drought conditions like the other ones are drought tolerant when they're established this one actually likes to be a little bit more on the wet side so if you have an area that's very sunny but you have issues with kind of moist soil that would be a really great variety for you and there are some varieties like the coreopsis grandiflora which gets quite large like upwards of three feet uh, large yellow blooms and this one is not a super reliable perennial but it does self seed so it will come back maybe just not in the exact location where you put it in the beginning so it's kind of worth looking into whatever variety you're interested in just to know its kind of growth habit how it's going to come back uh, before you plant it and that way you can plan for the right area to put it Number two are salvias. This is a huge group of plants that have a wide range of colors, of sizes. Some are annual, some are perennial, and that will depend on where you live. Um, like some of my favorite varieties, Plain the Blues, a new one I planted this year called Unplugged Pink. Those are annual varieties that won't come back for us here in a zone six from year to year, but there are a lot of hardy, tough varieties of salvias. Like a couple of my favorites are Indiglo Girl and Pink Profusion that perform so well for us in our garden. Those come back reliably every single year and the salvia group as a whole they're just a, an amazing plant a mainstay in our summer gardens because they give so much color and they also address a couple of problems because they're part of the sage family they do have a specific smell like you don't smell it when you're walking by them but when you're working with them and brushing up against them you do smell that kind of salvia smell which repels the rabbits and deer if that's something that you deal with but their blooms bring in so many pollinators so butterflies and honeybees always on these plants and the blooms last for a really long time usually they'll come out late spring with their first flush of bloom and then I actually just cut mine back yesterday uh, in preparation for their second bloom if you have a really long growing season there are years where I can get them to bloom three times which is pretty amazing but typical years we get two really long great bloom times out of them so let's talk about the pink profusion variety first because I think it's one of my favorites so it grows 16 inches tall by 20 inches wide and it's probably one of the most tidy kind of compact growing salvias I have ever seen and I love that in a plant I like to have all different structures of plants but I love that this one just looks kind of perfection out in the flower bed now I did plant my next to some lemon jade sedum which I think is a gorgeous pairing you've got the deep green of the salvia with the really saturated pink blooms and then the lighter green of the sedum with its chartreuse kind of yellow blooms just the contrast of the two is really beautiful i also really like the indiglo girl uh, which has really big bloom stalks like the blooms are bigger and thicker and a really deep purple and this one grows about 20 to 22 inches tall and wide the leaf canopy on it is still it's like Com not compact it's a little bit more bushy um, not quite as tight I guess you could say a little bit looser um, but I think they're both gorgeous to use in the garden I love them number three is yarrow and this is one of the very best sun loving perennials we can plant in our area here in the high desert it loves heat it can handle drought no insects bother it nothing bothers it it's just one of those things that you know you can put in the ground so long as it has some water every once in a while uh, they just perform and produce color that might have been in bloom now for 
oh, a few weeks now and we're here at the end of June and they just produce for the rest of the season. You can shear them back by about half after their first flush of bloom, kind of like salvias, and then have them rebloom. But I leave mine alone because I like to use the fresh blooms as well as the aged, aged blooms in arrangements because even the aged ones, even the ones that dry up on the plant have a beautiful color and they add beautiful texture to floral arrangements. So I love that. All I have to do is cut mine back once a year. That is all I ever do to my yarrow. I never fertilize it, nothing. <laughs> it just sits there and is awesome. My favorite variety is Firefly Peach Sky. It grows about three feet tall and about that wide. I mean, it's a pretty good size perennial zone, three through eight. Um, the colors on this one are just absolutely gorgeous. So when they emerge, they're just this intense kind of peach pink color. And then as they age, they um, start to fade to a little bit more of like just a regular peach color and then to a yellow and then to a light yellow. Um, and I actually leave my blooms on through the whole of the winter because the stems are stiff enough that they can withstand some snow. They look really pretty with frost and I still cut mine. Even in the dead of winter, I cut the spent dried blooms because I like to use them in arrangements. They're just so pretty. <laughs> the other variety I have in my garden and love is the Firefly Diamond, which is a pure white flower. And they're on top of um, really deep green leaves, which is interesting for a yarrow because a lot of yarrow kind of have dusty green leaves, which the Firefly Peach Sky, that's what it has is kind of like a dusty green blue kind of look. Um, and these are very deep green. So the contrast of the white with the green is really beautiful. This one doesn't grow quite as tall as the Firefly, Firefly Peach Sky. It usually clocks in at about 28 inches, but it grows 40 inches wide. Number four are Liatris, also known as Gay Feather or Blazing Star. These bloom from about midsummer through the rest of the year, and the blooms are really interesting looking. So first of all, they come up in these uh, kind of nice tidy clumps. The leaves are very narrow. They're a little bit late to emerge. Every year I kind of look at where mine are planted and think, are you going to come back? And sure enough, here it comes. Mine are not quite in bloom yet this year, but we're getting closer. Um, but the bloom stalks come up and then there's a whole bunch of individual blooms on each one of the bloom stalks, which each plant will produce a lot of stalks. Um, and some people describe them as being like feather boa esque, which I think is a very apt description. They're really interesting looking um, and they attract tons of pollinators. So I have them planted near our vegetable garden because I tried to choose things that will bring pollinators in. And the interesting part about liatris is that to my knowledge, they prefer to be in neutral to slightly acidic soil. And even though our soil is so high pH, ours just do so great for us here. They do like to be in well-draining soil, um, but I do keep mine fairly, I mean, they're consistently watered uh, and they seem to really enjoy their situation at the moment. A couple of different varieties. There's the Dotted Blazing Star, which has beautiful purple blooms from about the first part of August through fall. Uh, it doesn't grow super tall, like 12 to 18 inches tall and wide, I believe. But I read, because you can find Liatris like in prairies and, and meadow sort of situations, I've read that it is documented that the deepest roots from a Liatris go down 14 feet in a prairie sort of situation. Like that is the most drought tolerant variety of Liatris that I think there is. I have no idea if that's true, but if it is, that's pretty darn incredible. There is another variety called Floristin, Floristin White. I don't have that one in my garden yet, but I would like to add it. It grows taller, so three to four feet tall, um, and it blooms earlier. So it blooms a month earlier in July and then blooms for the rest of the season. Number five are Penstemon, also called Beard Tongue. We actually see these growing wild in the hills surrounding our area, which is awesome. There's so many different varieties. I mean, they range anywhere from uh, varieties that grow 10 inches tall to six feet tall, many different types of leaf structures and colors. I mean, you'll see some that are bright blue, some will be red, a lot will be pink and various colors of pink and lavender and white. Uh, and they bring hummingbirds into the garden. One of the best perennials for hummingbirds because they have tube shaped flowers that are really nectar rich. Um, and they're very drought tolerant as well. Very low maintenance. So my favorite variety is Midnight Masquerade. I've talked about it several times. It grows about 40 inches tall with its bloom stalks, uh, zone three through eight. The cool thing about this plant, it has kind of bicolor leaves, a deep burgundy with a little bit of green in them. And then the bloom stalks are a deep burgundy. The flowers are kind of a pale pinkish lavender color. And then when the flowers are done, they're replaced by little seed pods that are just little spheres. And I like to leave them on the plant even through the winter. Um, because they're gorgeous structure. They hold up to snow and they look really good in a cut flower arrangement. They add a really beautiful texture to uh, like as a filler in a flower arrangement. The Midnight Masquerade, one plant will actually grow almost three feet wide. I mean, so you're talking a huge stand 
beautiful stand of penstemon and they want a well draining soil that's average to on the dry side which is really nice a lot of us have i think more dry situations in our garden than we do uh, really wet or areas that hold on to a lot of moisture so this is a really good one for those hot dry spots plants are so oddly named if you're wondering how penstemon got the common name beard tongue it's because it's derived from the greek words penta and stemon um, referring to its five stamens so it has four fertile stamens and one uh, sterile stamen and the sterile stamen actually protrudes from the flower and it has little hairs on it so thus called beard tongue number six are daylilies which are amazingly low maintenance plants they don't have any diseases that bother them. Pests don't like them. Uh, you just have to deadhead them if you want to once their bloom stalks are done. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I mean, other than cutting them back, I usually cut mine back in the fall or you can do it in the spring either way, but that's all you have to do. And even when they're not in bloom, they just look like a beautiful ornamental grass. Um, usually they have like a medium green color leaf, which is long and strappy and uh, kind of thicker than a regular ornamental grass, but they just produce a really nice soft looking mound in the garden. Um, and daylilies are called daylilies because the lily flowers, each one of them only lasts for one day. But each bloom stalk usually puts on a ton of blooms that come off, you know, different times. And there are different types of daylilies. So some will bloom early, some will bloom mid, some will bloom late, and some will continuously bloom throughout the season. So it's really fun to do a little bit of research on the varieties that you really like, that you're drawn to, and figure out if you can uh, kind of have staggered bloom season with your daylilies. They're also able to withstand drought conditions, really crummy soil, and uneven even light. So if you, like many of us have flower beds that, you know, we'll have a tree that kind of shades part of it, but then another part of it will be full sun. Um, so it's hard to find things that will really thrive and look the same. If you plant a bunch of them in the same area, the daylilies can handle that sort of uneven light situation. Most all of the daylilies will attract all the pollinators too. So we're talking bees, butterflies, hummingbirds. I wanted to kind of highlight three varieties that I have in my garden that I really like. So I've got going bananas. I have some in several areas, but I love the ones right in front of our chicken coop they come up with these beautiful lemon yellow flowers and they're a type that repeat blooms throughout the season and they do have a really nice fragrance then i've got orange smoothie which grow about two feet tall and two feet wide and they have just a beautiful it's like a soft orange does that even make sense <laughs> It's a soft orange color, a little bit roughly on the edges. Um, I have them in front of a big stand of Stand By Me Clematis, which is a bush type clematis. It's purpley blue color. So you've got that purple blue with the orange right in front. It's so gorgeous. Um, so orange smoothie usually blooms right in the middle of the season, and then it blooms again later on in the season. And then there's Sound of My Heart, which grows about two by two as well, maybe a little bit taller than that. But the flowers are big, usually about five inches in diameter. The color is super unique. Unique. So really beautiful kind of pastel pink and then this deep kind of like purple burgundy in the center and then around the edges of the flower and they're really kind of ruffly. They're just um, eye-catching. And that one is a continuous bloomer so it reblooms throughout the season. Number seven is Artemisia or Artemisia. Artemisia? Artemisia doesn't matter. Also called wormwood. This one is not grown for its flower. It's grown rather for its leaves and its leaf color. So I think it's good to have a mixture in a perennial border of things that will both flower and then things that are grown just for its the way the leaves look. Uh, because if you had everything in your border flowering, I think it would be very visually stimulating, but I think it's good to have a place every once in a while to provide weight in the garden, to give your eye a place to rest so that it's not fighting for, you know, all these flowers are fighting for attention. So I think Artemisia is one of those beautiful perennials that provides the silvery blue leaf structure and the really quite nice growth habit. There's some really wonderful varieties out there. Um, they just provide that kind of rest for your eye. And the silver color of the leaves go with any kind of color palette you can throw at it. Now they do like a more dry soil situation, full sun, um, well draining. They don't want to be in overly wet soil. So that's the only thing about that one. If your soil stays wet or it's very heavy clay, the Artemisia probably won't be super happy with you uh, for putting it there. But I actually have an Artemisia up in one of our front flower beds. It's actually really Really close by where I'm at under a locust tree where we just ripped out all of the water early this spring um, because we're redoing the flower bed I left a couple things around the base of the locust tree thinking and maybe I would dig them it's still sitting there no drip to it it's been you know in the hundreds for a while now and it's still like thriving I hardly ever give it any water and it looks amazing and I love plants we've got to have some of those type of plants in our garden where we just can kind of plant it and forget it a favorite variety of mine is Powys Castle, which grows about three foot by three foot 
really kind of tidy, uniform growth habit though. Really gorgeous plant, really finely textured, silvery gray. I really like that perennial. And then you have varieties like Silver Bullet, which is more of a ground cover type. So it grows about 10 inches tall, up to 30 inches wide. It has more of a bold leaf structure, very silver. Like it's very, um, it almost could provide you that kind of white accent. It's a beautiful spiller plant in containers as well. Uh, did I say it's a zone five through nine? And they're all very tolerant of differing soil pH, which I appreciate for our area here. We're high pH. I think I say that about every video. <laughs> Number eight are Gallardia, also called blanket flowers. And this is also a very large plant category. There's a lot of different varieties, some of which are annual, like the Heated Up series that I plant every year. Let's see, Heated Up Yellow, Heated Up Scarlet. They are amazing. I mean, they take up a huge spot in a container. I planted them both in ground and in containers. They do great, but there's also perennial varieties and they're called blanket flowers because they slowly, very slowly will kind of move around. They'll kind of self seed um, and multiply and blanket an area. You can find varieties in the zone range three through 10. And while they are drought tolerant, once they're established, they do thrive in kind of a consistently moist, but well draining area. So an area, full sun area that has like a drip system or a, a consistent way to get water, that's where they're gonna love their life. They also rarely have an insect problem that I know of and deer don't really like to eat them either. A few varieties that I really like, there's Mesa Peach, first off, I think that might be one of my favorite varieties. Soft golden yellow petals with peach interior. Um, just very softly colored, even though they're a bicolor flower. So they tuck in really easily with other things in the border. Usually you'll find them toward the front of your flower border because they don't get enormously tall. There's a variety called Amber Wheels, which has kind of frilled deep gold, uh, deep yellow petals. And then there is Fanfare Blaze, which kind of has a burnt orange and red typically. Like I like this flower, even though it's got more of a red tinge to it um, because it's so unique. So each wheel of flowers has individual, like each petal is an individual tube. So it's a very interesting, unique looking bloom. And that one has a zone range of three through 10. That's crazy. You don't usually find uh, plants that span that kind of a zone range. Number nine are perennial hibiscus, also called rose mallow. So they're the dinner plate size bloomed hibiscus plants, very tropical looking, but very hardy. Usually like in the zone four through nine range, if I'm not mistaken. So they can withstand some pretty cold wintertime temperatures. They come up fresh from the ground every year uh, and they quickly turn into what appears to be like a small to medium sized shrub. They grow so, so fast. The interesting part about them though, is that they are one of the last things to emerge from the ground every year and every year you'll think yours are dead and they're not <laughs> they just take a while to uh, emerge they need a lot of heat but once they start to push growth they will grow so fast and produce so many blooms for you uh, they do like water they're actually termed a bog plant if you've got a real wet area and like wet problem area in your garden plant a bunch of hibiscus in it uh, because they will love you for it and they will be very productive and happy plants so when you cut your plants back you usually want to do that in the spring and you'll cut the old stalks down to about six inches above the ground and they won't emerge new growth from those old stems they'll emerge from the ground but by cutting them up a little bit uh, a ways from the crown of the plant you do protect that crown from any like late freezes or weird weather that way so mine are about in bloom right now it's usually a midsummer through the rest of the season sort of bloomer and they do bring hummingbirds in and bees and butterflies all the pollinators and deer usually pass them by to my understanding. I've got a few different varieties in my garden. A couple of my favorites are Evening Rose, which grows about four feet tall by about maybe four and a half, five feet wide. Um, they have very dark colored leaves. So almost like a, a purple, black, green kind of mix leaf. And then uh, huge flowers, like eight inch, really bright pink flowers. So the, the bright pink with the dark colored foliage is really striking. And then there's a variety that's fairly new-ish, I think. It's called Spinderella. And this one grows about four feet tall, four and a half feet wide. And it's got a, I think the base color of the bloom is white, but then it's got kind of swirls of pink in it, almost giving you, I don't even know how to describe it, like maybe tie-dye or something like that. It's a really interesting looking bloom. So you can really find a hibiscus that will fit into any color scheme. Number 10 on my list is Nepeta or Catmint. Where would our gardens be without Nepeta? I mean, honestly, it's one of the easiest to grow perennials, one of the toughest growing perennials. 
and they're so beautiful all the time. Uh, so there's a lot of different varieties. Some of them stay really short, kind of ground cover style, and some of them, I think, what's it called? The tallest variety is Six Hills Giant, I think, three feet tall. So you can find an Epida for any garden situation in full sun. They have gray-green leaves and then purple blooms. I have a variety called Cat's Pajamas planted all over the place in my garden. And the cool thing about it is that the, the blooms are beautiful and striking, kind of a, they're a very saturated blue, but the blooms start all the way down on their bloom stalk by the soil and go all the way up to the tip of the plant. So it's not just like this plant has a, a bloom or a leaf canopy rather, and then sends up little bloom stalks with little blooms above the leaf canopy. No, this one is just, it blooms. The whole plant looks like it's in bloom. They're amazing plants. Typically zone three through eight. Nepeta also is resistant to deer and rabbits. It attracts all the pollinators. There are always honeybees on mine. And even when they're almost bloomed out, they're still honeybees. Now I did shear mine back by about half yesterday and they already had new bloom stalks underneath. Like they're already starting to form new ones after I sheared the old ones off. Um, but even when they're not in bloom, it's kind of like some of the salvia I talked about earlier, the calyx, which holds the bloom in place onto the stem. Those are really nicely colored as well. So even when the blooms are spent, they don't look um, bad. They don't make the plant look bad and I love that. Number 11 are flocks and there are a lot of different kinds of flocks that bloom at different times of year. I'm talking about more of the upward upright growing flocks so there are a lot of different sizes. You can get really tall ones. These that I'm going to talk about today there's opalescence and then luminary uh, backlight which is a new one for next year but they're more medium sized flocks and then you've got your ground cover types that bloom earlier on in the season. Flocks have been a favorite for a lot of years but some of the older varieties had some issues. A lot of powdery mildew issues to be uh, more specific. Uh, some of these new newer varieties that are out are resistant to powdery mildew and I mean I'm talking some of the older varieties even in our super dry high desert climate some of the old varieties struggle with powdery mildew even for us and that's not usually a problem for us but I've had these newer varieties in our garden for a while now and they just do really well. They still uh, prefer to have an area where it's not super dense. You don't want to just throw them in the middle of a bunch of other stuff. You want to make sure they still have good airflow, but they've got wonderful fragrance. They bloom for most of the summer and they bring pollinators in and there's a lot of different colors. Also, they do want a spot that's well draining, but very consistent moisture. So you do want to make sure you put it in an area that consistent irrigation is going to reach the roots of that plant. It'll make it a lot happier. So I wanted to talk about opalescence variety first because it's probably one of the one of the best for disease resistance and powdery mildew resistance but also one of the most fragrant flocks I've ever smelled. Um, it was I think it was last year we planted some in one of our borders. I had three different varieties in our trailer and I kept smelling something that was wonderful and I kept, well, where is that coming from? And I ended up narrowing it down to the opalescence variety. Not the other two that were in the trailer, but it was that one, which is uh, a pink, light pink flower with a dark pink eye. So they're really striking visually and they have very dark green leaves, uh, but they are just so highly fragrant. And I love having the, that type of plant dotted around in my garden because I want to hit all the senses if we can. Not just sight, you know, not just how they feel, but I want to smell them too, so long as they smell good. <laughs> So the Luminary Backlight is a new variety for next year that I'm excited about because it's a pure white flower, uh, 30 inches tall by a couple feet wide. So it's a lot like some of the older varieties, but it's highly disease resistant, even in hot and humid climates. So I, I think it's great if we can take some of these older plants and make them handle the conditions that they once had to deal with and not thrive in, but now they can handle it and they'll look great. I think that's awesome. And I really like to have white flowers in my board, borders too. So I'm excited for that one. Did I mention both of those varieties are a zone three through eight? Number 12 is Monarda, also called Bee Balm. I love this perennial, um, not just for its flower. The flowers are very distinctive, very unique. They're kind of, if you look very closely, they're individual flowers at the top of a stalk. So like with salvia, you have a stalk that comes up and then you've got calyxes that go, you know, from tip and they go down the stalk a certain ways and they hold on the blooms. Well, the monarda send up a stalk and then all the calyxes come off in like a whirl on the top of this stalk holding on the bloom. So it kind of looks like an umbrella, like a fan or an umbrella or something like that. And each individual uh, tube has two lips at the bottom. 
Like if you really look close at these flowers, there's some really interesting detail, but it's not just the flowers I like them for, it's the smell. It's a nostalgic smell for me. Every time I brush up against a Monarda, uh, it's the leaves that have the smell. They're so, they're in the mint family and they but they don't act like mint they don't take over your life like one mint plant would um, but they have kind of this lightly mint kind of just reminiscent smell of my childhood just throws me right back they bloom for six plus weeks they combine really well with other perennials they attract all the pollinators and they're a really excellent cut flower as well a couple of varieties that i like there's the leading lady lilac i remember i was working at the garden center at the time where this one was being introduced and we had one customer that kept asking me year after year do you have any leading lady lilac any leading lady lilac i kind of knew like when she approached me i'm like she's gonna ask me for leading lady lilac and now i know why they're just beautiful lavender lilac flowers um, that are fairly petite. So only 14 inches tall, 28 inches wide, zone four through eight. And then there's Pardon My Lavender, which grows a little bit taller, so 18 inches, stays a little bit more narrow at 12 inches, and kind of has lavender pink flowers. They look fairly similar, but different enough. I could have them both in the same bed and be happy. Number 13 are Veronica or Speedwell. I love Veronica in my garden. I love it. I've got it all over the place. I have a variety called White Wands, which is a favorite of mine. There's Purple Illusion, which I like. There's Wizard of Oz. Um, I like Pink Veronicas. I just like that they're a tidy perennial. You can find them in a lot of different sizes. So from like a ground cover that grows eight to 10 inches tall up to varieties that'll grow three feet tall. I kind of like the ones that fall in, in between, like the very kind of tidy, <laughs> tidy perennials. Um, but they throw up little bloom stalks. Um, so blooms on like spikes looking blooms that attract tons of pollinators and the really cool thing about Veronica that I didn't know and maybe this was just a one-off but I went went to cut mine back I cut a lot of my stuff back in the fall which I know is not recommended but that's how I get I get it done <laughs> um, but I went to cut it back and I saw that it was a host plant for ladybugs there were larvae ladybug larva and live ladybugs, adult ladybugs everywhere on those plants. So I left them alone. There was not, there must've been a food source nearby. There wasn't a food source on the Veronica. So it's not like the Veronica was covered with aphids or whatever, but there was just tons. It was just the neatest thing. And I recently posted a video. It was either on, I can't remember if it was on Facebook or Instagram, either way. Um, I posted a video of our white wands veronica with all the different pollinators just multiple different kinds of bees and flies and things like that that come and pollinate our plants um, they're just covered with them constantly and veronica when it blooms it kind of like salvia you come in or nepa you come in and shear back the first uh, flush of bloom and then it'll bloom again i leave mine up typically um, and so even the white wands it'll start looking like fresh blooms on the white wands do look better but um, if i don't shear mine back i just have constant blooms all the time even with a few spent blooms mixed in but they're always covered with pollinators and i always feel horrible if i go in to cut them back so there's a lot of different varieties they can span from a zone three to a zone 11 depending on what variety you're dealing with um, they like a well draining area somewhere that's not overly wet but they do like consistent moisture sometimes it can be hard to strike the balance with some plants but veronica are very easy to grow they seem to like every area I've put them in my garden. So real quick, the white wands grows about 16 inches tall. I think mine gets taller than that. I think it gets closer to 20. Like it's pushing the two foot mark. Um, by 20 inches, zone four through eight, white flowers, of course, dark green, dark green leaves, beautiful perennial and the purple illusion stays a little bit smaller than that. And it's a little bit more tidy. And that was the type that I had the ladybug population on. Number 14 is Gara. I love Gara. We've got Gara around our fountain in that triangular shaped garden area. It's got boxwood hedge around it, and then a fountain in the middle, and then it fills up with Gara every year. The other name for it is whirling butterflies because that's how it looks. They grow in kind of a vase shape uh, with these flowers that can range. Usually white and pinks are what you'll find Gara in, um, but they flutter in the breeze. They're just this ethereal looking plant. Um, you'll find them growing in a different range of sizes and different zones and things like that, um, but they are a beautiful plant. Now they are drought tolerant once they're established. They do form a tap root. So they're a type of perennial that you want to put in the spot where they can stay. They don't want to be moved around a whole bunch or at all. 
they will resent you for that. So of course, with the name Whirling Butterflies, they're gonna, of course, attract butterflies. They're great at doing that. I always see things flying above them and they also attract honeybees. So the typical Whirling Butterflies variety you'll see grows three feet tall um, and it has white blooms with kind of red sepals, giving it kind of a pinkish look toward the base of the flower. And I think that's largely what I have, just the Whirling Butterflies variety in the back garden. Um, and then I've filled in over the years with a few other varieties. Some varieties will have variegated leaves. I can't off the top of my head remember that variety name, but there's also a Carely Petite Pink, which is a zone six through 10. Um, and that's an exciting one because it's a, it's a saturated but light pink color bloom with a deeper colored leaf on it. And then there's Stratosphere White, which is a bright white bloom. And that one is a zone six through 11, grows about two feet tall, foot and a half white, and both of them, all of them, typically bloom from about May all the way through September. And the last perennial on my list, number 15, are Nephophia or Red Hot Pokers. I never in a million years thought I would have Red Hot Pokers in my garden. And that's because I didn't know about some of the hybrids that were available, my favorite being Flashpoint. So it's not red at all, it's yellow. It's a pale yellow and a white and a saturated yellow, all in the same, it's like an ice cream cone kind of, look to me uh, and it's a graduation of color they're bright even when they're not in bloom which they'll bloom usually two times a season really strong for me um, but they look like a very strappy leaved clump of ornamental grass they're just a great looking plant all the time not to mention the fact that they like full sun they can handle a lot of drought and they still will perform the blooms also make for excellent cut flowers in fact i went out this morning i cut a big handful of hot and cold variety nephophia which is an orange and yellow kind of bicolor variety and here we're getting close to 4th of July. They kind of look like a firework to me, like a firecracker. And so I think I'm gonna use them as part of my 4th of July decorations. They're perfect for that. They last quite a long time in a vase. They also attract all the pollinators. When their bloom stalks are done, you do wanna go in and clean those up. You don't have to, but the plant does look better. Doesn't usually take very long to do that. Just cut the bloom stalk off as far down into the plant leaf canopy as you can. And that will actually prolong the blooms for the rest of the plant because the plant won't be trying to keep anything alive up, up top um, and then in the fall or spring I do mine in the fall but we cut ours back to the ground just like three inches above the ground and they come back fresh every single year and that's it you guys that is my list of 15 heat loving perennials we got to have those kinds of things in our garden especially when we're going through such a heat spell as we are right now and some of you guys are going through more heat than you ever have in your area which is just it's been crazy this year so it's nice to have some things in our gardens at any point of the year that really look good and that thrive and if we organize and plan our garden spaces out just right, then we'll always have things that look great all the time. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope it was helpful. It was sure nice for me to sit underneath a fan in a cooler part in the shade on this 106 degree day. We will see you guys in the next video. Bye.